Well, welcome back to our Sunday, Sunday adult Bible class we're offering here online at Crosstown. And we're glad that you're joining us once again. We're studying this incredible, this so familiar and beloved parable of Jesus, the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son as we're calling it. And so we have, uh, you know, last week we began uh, looking at this parable through the eyes of the younger son as he made his way back home to the father. And today we're going to look at this parable through the eyes of the older brother. This is very uh, powerful and exciting when you look at this message that Jesus gives. And for the older brother, there are two moments that you see in this passage, in this text, that I think uh, are important to see. Uh, now you may go, well, how is the older brother in, involved here? Well, let's, let's look at this. Now again, notice how Jesus begins as he's teaching these three parables. We've talked about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and now we've been looking at the lost son. And notice how he begins this third parable in verse 11 of Luke 15. And of Luke 15, beginning in verse 11. So Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Give me my share of the inherent estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, we've looked at this last week. You remember how the younger son coming to the father saying, give me my inheritance was in essence the younger son saying to his father, I wish you were dead. Because the father would have to liquidate, he would have to sell their land to give his son the inheritance. And so it says that uh, the father divided his property, but here's where we see a problem with the older brother, and it's it's not obvious here in the in the text as much. But the problem is, we know culturally that the the older brother does not step in into this situation. That was huge, and it, it kind of it, we miss that in our contemporary audience and and understanding. But in Jesus's culture, that was huge, and they would have picked up on that immediately. You see, if there was a riff, if there was a, uh, a problem between the father and the younger son, uh, it was the responsibility of the older son to step in. Uh, he was to take on the role of the reconciler, we might say. Um, the older brother, first of all, would have refused this, uh, this dividing up the, um, uh, the father's uh, estate. And so here is the, the person closest to the father and the son, the older brother, the reconciler that is supposed to step in. And again, what's even more shocking is the text says he divided his property between them. So the older son participates in this request of the younger son. The older brother accepted his share of, of the inheritance of the estate. This would have been two thirds would have been given to the older son. And so the older brother doesn't step in and say, no, we are gonna resolve this. We're gonna work for reconciliation and no way will I participate in receiving of my father's inheritance while he's still alive. He doesn't do any of that. And Jesus's listeners would have made that connection, that although the older son stayed, he was just as guilty as the younger son who left. And so that's moment one. And this is why what we see in, in moment one, what makes moment two so unbelievable uh, and explosive. And so, you know, you know what happens next, of course, in... Uh, um, uh, as again, Jesus' audience would have made that connection with the older son staying, being guilty as the younger son. And so you know what happens next. Of course, the younger son takes, he's liquidated his inheritance. He, he's got a, a pocket full of money and off he goes into the far country. We talked about the Decapolis there uh, in that region, uh, Greco-Roman cities, uh, very pagan. And he goes off and he spends, he wastes his inheritance on, on prodigal living. 
and he, he, there's a great drought in the land, and he is without uh, any resources. And uh, remember, the only job he can get is feeding the pigs, and he longs to fill his stomach with their pods. And finally, he comes to his senses, and he goes back to his father, and he's got this plan or this plot. He's kind of conniving that he'll go back and just be a servant, kind of not in relationship with the father. And so he comes up with that elaborate plan, and so he comes back, and you remember he's met with grace, incredible, extravagant grace. The father runs to him, and he hugs him, and he kisses him, and he gives him a ring and puts sandals on his feet, and, and they kill the fatted calf, and the, the father just showers grace upon the son. And so here, moment two now, the older son. The older brother is going to find out about the younger brother coming home uh, and what the father has done. Look here in the text, beginning in verse 22 of Luke 15. Uh, remember here, it goes back up a little bit. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, and sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And there's the emphasis you see uh, two times in the text. So they began to celebrate, celebrate. Now that's kind of the operative word there that you see in the text. And again, that's with these other parables Jesus has taught, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and now the lost son. What do they all have in common? That which is lost was found and they celebrate, they celebrate, they celebrate. And so the old, older brother now Meanwhile, verse 25, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has, has him back safe and sound. So the brother is out in the uh, field and he is unaware of everything that has happened. But this is significant. Again, we, we likely overlook this in the years of separation between our culture and time when this was written. Uh, uh, New Testament scholar Greg Keener writes in his, uh, uh, his IVP Bible, uh, Bible Backgrounds Commentary. Listen to what he writes. That the elder brother is apparently the only person in the village uninformed about the party burst the bounds of plausibility in the real world where the elder brother should have himself have taken the lead at reconciling father and younger son. Keener continues, This touch of unrealism is necessary to graphically underline the older brother's isolation from the community. This is huge. Because Jesus, you know, he's telling this story, the details of the story, and he's... He's highlighting this for the real people that are listening to him. And he's showing there's this isolation that exists between the, the older brother, the older son. There's this gap with the older brother. And so again in verse 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Now friends, this is huge as well. He refused to go in. This would have been incredibly shameful on his, on his part. Remember, the whole community is there. This involves the whole village. There's no private matter here in this, in this time period here, in this community. So the younger son has shamed his father. He has come, that has been done in front of the whole community. He's now returned, and this is celebrated with the whole community. And so while the older brother, this older son of the father, refusing to come in, he is bringing shame on the father. He didn't step in and be the reconciler. He even accepted his inheritance while his own father was alive. And now he's out in the field and he refuses to go in. And not only does the father accept this, the father shames himself by going out and pleading with the older son to come in. Uh, something the, the host party would never do. 
in the first century. Jesus even taught some other parables about the shame and dishonor of, of a host inviting a great banquet and feast and people not coming or responding. And you see this playing out. He refused to go in. And notice what he says here next in his, uh, in his words here. He says in verse 29, He answered his father, Look. I mean, he doesn't even have the, the respect to address his father. He just, you know, with a proper title, Look, all of these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Oh, do you see what he says? It is just how he's missed it, the older son has. He says, all these years I've been slaving for you. You see that? Slaving for you. Oh, no. He thinks he's a slave and not a son. A son in the father's house. He sees himself as a slave. And he says, I, I've never disobeyed you. And you never gave me a young goat to celebrate with my friends. Look what he says in verse 30. But when this son of yours, the older son, the older brother continues here. When this, older, when this son of yours has, who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Notice he doesn't even identify uh, that this is his brother. Your, this, this son of yours. He doesn't identify him as his brother. Well, notice how the father responds, of course, in verse 31 and 32. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. My son, he says, the father to the older, older son, not my slave, not my servant, my son, this brother of yours, this brother that you want to reject, that's a part of your family and our family. Oh, this story is just laced with tension and confrontation. You know, we step back and we say, what's the brother's deal? What's the issue here? Uh, well, it's not issue, it's issues. Exactly. It's, there's, there's several here. You know, he identifies one from the very start when he's talking to his father and he says, you never killed the fattened calf for me. He's angry about the calf. Uh, again, to kill the fattened calf, this was to fill a large amount of people. This is not just a family meal. Again, this is for the whole community. This is taking place in front of the whole community, and they're going to rejoice and celebrate with the whole community. It was very costly. And if we understand the story correctly, as I was just saying, that the father divided his inheritance, then technically, who owns this fattened calf? That's right, the older, the older son does. And so he's angry at the father's generosity because it came at a great cost to him. I think that's something important. Um, so you have this fattened calf. He's also angry about the father's grace, that the father has, he despises the father's grace that he's extended to his brother that he ran out to him, that he kissed him, that he hugged him, that he put a ring on his finger, that he put sandals on, a feet, on his feet, that he's, uh, in spite of everything he's done, you know, the, the older brother says, older son, well, you know, he squandered it with prostitutes. And we don't know if that's what happened. Likely it did. That's what this young man would have done, more than likely in that faraway country. But he despises the father's grace, but it goes deeper than this. Uh, you know, it really does. I think that, uh, that we, we, we understand this. You know, as we think about what is at the heart of the brother's issues, it's not just the fattened calf. It's not even just that he despises the grace that the father has given his younger brother. It's that I think that the, the, the older son sees his obedience as a means of obtaining his father's love and acceptance. He sees his obedience as a, as, a, as a means of obtaining his father's love and obedience. Um, 
That's really his biggest issue. I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders, he says. He sees his obedience and what he does to the Father as a way of obtaining his Father's love, his Father's acceptance. To, that's his identity of seeing himself as a part of the family, that, that father, his Father loves and acceptance, accepts him because of his obedience to the Father. And this is really the deepest issue playing out with the older son. You know, the, the great reveal in this story is, we, we're calling it the, the parable of the prodigal son, but really, the older brother is lost as well. And so we, it's not really the parable of the prodigal son, if we're really going to get technical and, and, and understand this, it's the parable of the lost sons, plural. Lost sons. Both of these boys sons are lost. Remember the context of Jesus told this parable? These parables go back in Luke 15, the beginning of the chapter. Do you remember when he told the parable, these parables of the lost sheep and lost coin and now this lost son? Remember it was because the tax collectors and sinners were, were gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. He's having a meal. He is, he is seen and as receiving those who are on the outside of the religious leaders, the establishment. And so there are actual characters. Even though there are characters in this story, there are real-life people that Jesus is looking at and speaking to. The, the tax collectors and sinners, we talked about them a couple of weeks ago. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the religious leaders. And so we might kind of say, the tax collectors and sinners, uh, they, they represent the younger son. That's who they are. And then the Pharisees and teachers, the religious people, they're represented by the older son. And then, of course, you know who God and Jesus are represented as. They're represented as the father in the story, represented as the father. And so Jesus is sharing a meal. He's welcoming sinners. He is accepting them. We need to celebrate this. We, and so he tells these three stories on how to celebrate. But the parable of the lost son really goes deeper. It really does, friend. Because the older son, listen, represents those who are lost but have been found. The younger son represents those who are lost but have been found. But the younger son, not only does the younger son uh, point to that, that, that uh, lesson, the older son represents those who think they are found but are actually lost. They think they're found, but they're actually lost. Actually lost. Those who are in the inside, those who are in the family, if you will, are actually a bit lost. Again, we've said for the older son, he sees his obedience as a means of obtaining the father's love and acceptance. So Jesus is challenging the religious people in the room that day. That when it comes to our relationship with God, look, God doesn't love us because we are obedient. God doesn't love us because we're obedient. God loves us for who we are. Now, here's the key. We are obedient because we love God. That's, that's critical. You can't have one without the other. They're, both of these are two, two important part, sides of the coin. Um, we don't obey God to earn his love. We don't obey God to, to gain his acceptance. We do it precisely because we love God and are in a relationship with God. You see, God's love language is obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So don't anyone think we're minimizing obedience in our faith, in our relationship with God. Because it is through our obedience that we demonstrate to God that we love him that we recognize we're in a relationship with him, that we want to take him seriously and his word and to live a life that demonstrates that love and that obedience, that we want to live out that relationship 
in, in, in what God is inviting us into. But friends, we do not earn our way into God's love and acceptance. We do not earn our way with God's love and acceptance. I believe this is the issue for the older brother. That's what Jesus is challenge, challenging the religious leaders of his day. And I think we would say that when we employ a works righteousness mentality in a grace-oriented home, listen, you can become numb, bitter, angry, and titled jealous and judgmental. When you employ a works righteousness mentality in a grace-oriented home, that's ex exactly, precisely what we see the older son doing. He sees the father's household from a works righteousness mindset. But the father sees it as a grace-oriented home. Where the father extend, extends extravagant grace and love and mercy and goodness. He wants everyone to experience those who've been lost uh, to be welcomed in the Father's home just as I am a sinner before God. And so the Father says again, verse 31 and 32, My son, you've always been with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive and was lost and is found. Did you notice what he says? Everything I have is yours to the older son. Everything I have is yours. And yet the older son, who has everything, thinks he has nothing. That's what's so sad here. That's because he's misunderstood the father's love. How the father works. And so when you employ works righteousness, that mentality in a grace-oriented home, you often, what you see is numb, bitterness, angry, a sense of entitled jealousy and a judgmental attitude. Friends, you've seen it. I've seen it among people who profess faith, even in the, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. You've seen that played out. It's a grace-oriented place that is not dependent upon that works righteousness mentality. We see, therefore, with the older brother, he's bitter, he's all of these things. He's judgmental in what he's saying. So, friends, how do, we, how do we know if we are lost in the inside? How do we know if we're a bit lost in the inside? If, if this is really dr being driven home for us, uh, especially those maybe who uh, are here this morning or in the church and, and, and you know, well, I think that's, that's important here. I think there's a, there's, a, there's a key indicator. There's a key indicator. And I think that key indicator is joy. And I think we would simply ask the question, do you have joy? Do you have joy? That's an indicator of, of whether you're functioning in that grace-oriented high home or this works righteousness mentality. You see, I think joy is the litmus test of whether we are experiencing a thriving relationship with God or if we are a bit lost on the inside. I think joy is the key that we've lost that joy, that we've misunderstood and misunderstand what it's like to, to be in relationship with God, that we are not obedient to earn God's love and acceptance, that we've misunderstood what it's like to celebrate with other people who, who maybe we don't believe and think des are deserving of God's grace and God's love that we've received, or we don't see them uh, living as we think they should be living. Or we see God just lavishing his grace upon them. If we start to feel like, well, you know, I don't think they really deserve that. Or look what I'm doing. Look at how I'm obedient to God. Look how I am not sinning like that. Friends, if that's the case, then we're lost from the inside. When we begin to experience resentment and bitterness and jealousy and anger, and they don't deserve that. In our heart of hearts, deep down within us, we may not express them to other people, but we know what's in our heart, what we think and feel. You see, joy is the test. Joy is the test. If we exude joy, if we, if we model that, if we have a sense of joy 
Because we understand the Father's love and grace. We understand how much grace we have been given. And as we talked about last week, therefore we will extend that to other people. We'll extend that grace. We will celebrate with those who are lost and have been found. Especially people we don't associate with. Especially people who aren't like us. They don't look like us. They don't talk like us. They don't think like us. They don't dress like us. They don't vote like us. Do I need to keep going? Do you get the picture? We join in the celebration because we're in a right relationship with the Father. We recognize what the Father is all about. We recognize that we are an avenue through which God wants to extend that grace to others. Again, we had to celebrate because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and the story just stops, ends right there. What happens next? What does the father do? What does this older brother do? Older son, does he go in? Does he stay? Does he? What happens? The story leaves us right there in the field with the older brother. The father is there, and he says, My older son, there's a party going on. I'd like for you to join us and be a part of it. And I believe Jesus ends the parable right here to confront his audience. To say, hey, there's a party going on. The Father in heaven is celebrating. They're celebrating in heaven. We are celebrating. Do you want to join the party or not? That's where he leaves it. And the older brother had to make a decision. And we have no idea what that decision was that he made. We're called to finish the story, friends. We are called to finish the story. I believe if we have joy, we will want to join in the party. Those who are lost and are found. Sinners who are coming and to, to hear Christ, to receive Christ, and to obey the gospel, and to uh, come to the grace of God that that calls us right where we're at and all of our warts and sins and weaknesses and, 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 and everything. We'll want to join in the party. So I hope the Holy Spirit is convicting you, certainly convicting me with this story. At times, we and myself, I know, have acted too much like the older brother. We have. And may we get back to the heart of the Father. May we get back to the heart of the gospel and experience the kind of joy where we will always want to join the party and, re and welcome and celebrate with those that are seeking and finding the Lord and his salvation. Again, we're glad that you joined us this, uh, today. We hope that you'll join us next Sunday as we'll continue in this incredible parable of uh, the lost son. Thank you for being with us here this morning.